related mathematically. Now, one key, which is the private key, should be kept safe. That's the secret key. The second key you can encrypt using the private key or using the public key. You cannot encrypt and decrypt using the same key. You have to use the second pair in order to encrypt or decrypt. Now, we will look at OpenSSL and how do we generate a key pair. One is, one is a private key and the second one is the public key. But the beauty, the beauty of asymmetric encryption or using a key pair is the fact that they're not only used in encryption. They are also used to authenticate the identity of the second peer. A server that wishes to have a digital certificate must generate a key pair. It must generate a public key and a private key. There are different algorithms that uh, will allow it to do so. We will use RSA. Now we'll use OpenSSL, uh, GenRSA, and let's name our um, our key pair. Let's name it 40 key, and let's contain it in, in a PM uh, format, which is a container that will include both keys. And let's decide that the size of the keys will be 2048 bit. And that's about it. Now, if we wish to see the both the public key and the private key to inspect them individually, we can do so using the following command. Open SSL. RSA, let's insert the file that we have just created, 40key.pm, and let's get the public key out of it. And let's name it mykey.pub. All right, it's writing it. Let's see how it looks. Let's open the key and that's our uh, public key. Now if we wish to see the private key we can use the following command and that's the private key. So we have a public key and a private key and those two are used when a server requests a certificate using a certificate signing request, it sends the public key as a part of its information. We will look later on how a certificate authority takes that information and actually creates a digital certificate plus a digital signature that will prove that he or it is the one that it claims to be. Hey everyone, back to Fortigate Certificates and in this part three, we will look at hash functions. Now what is a hash function? A hash function is a mathematical function that takes any input and produces a hash value. Now, the hash value is always in a fixed size according to the hash function that was used. The hash value is also called a digest and it should be impossible to produce the same value for two different inputs. So the function is actually collusion free. Now, a hash function must be quick. It has to produce the hash value very fast. And 
A slight change on the input should change the entire hash value completely. So even if we have a one gigabyte file full of text and we change a comma in one of the sentences, the hash value will change completely. So we have the input, we have the hash function, and we have the digest, the hash value. Now, when do we use it? We use it for integrity. Whenever we send a file, it can be just about any file, and we want to check its integrity, that no one touched it, no one tampered with the bit stream. We make a hash value out of the file, and then on the other side, we compare the same file using the same hash function. If the two hash values are the same, then no one tampered with the file. If the hash value changes, then someone probably touched the file. There are dozens of hash functions that are used just about anywhere. When a web server stores uh, passwords in its database, they are being hashed. They are being hashed using different hash functions such as the SHA-256 or the SHA-512. To make the hash stronger, we also use what is known as a SALT. We generate a random numbers to be added to the password itself and thus the uh, hash value will be much more difficult to guess. Now, now the term guessing is the right term since hashes are in no way an encryption technique. They are not used for encryption. They are only a mathematical function, a one-way mathematical function that takes an input, turns it into another value, and there is no way back. They are not reversible. All right, so enough, enough with that. Let's move over to OpenSSL. Let's uh, reproduce some hashes out of different inputs. And at the end, that will probably be part four of the series. We will recap what we have learned uh, by now that is symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, and hash functions. And we will look at certificate, a digital certificate, and understand how it all matches. All right, so we'll use OpenSSL, but let's start out by using the echo command. And let's write down some text. I have a secret message. All right, now let's grab it into OpenSSL and let's use uh, MD5. MD5 is a hash function that produces a 128-bit value. Now that's the uh, hash uh, value of that text. Now if I'll use the same, if I'll use the same text, but I'll add, I'll change the E to an A, you see that I get another hash value, completely different hash value. Let's go back to the same uh, text and it will produce the same hash value as before. Now, if we will use the SHA-256 hash function, you can see that we actually get the output as a 256-bit value. It is much stronger than MD5. We can also do it using the 512 bit, which produces stronger hash value. Now, how does it all have to do with digital certificate and digital signatures? We will look at it in our next video, which will be the last part of the series. But let's just look out at 
a digital certificate and as you can see we have the public key which is the asymmetric encryption we also have a signature algorithm which is the hash function as we just spoke about and in part four we will see how it all mixes out with the symmetric encryption to make sure that we have confidentiality authenticity and integrity <laughs> One of the toughest topics to understand when we deal with security appliance is probably the world of certificates, a digital certificate. Why? Because understanding certificates means that you have to understand what is asymmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, and hash functions. Now, we will start with a video series that will try to lighten up the issue and we will start with a basic uh, introduction to symmetric encryption we will do it using OpenSSL so a symmetric encryption means and that is the very basic meaning that we take a plain text we use an algorithm which is a mathematical function that uses substitution and uses transpositioning and we are using a key a key that is known to both parties the key is the same later on we will deal with the key space and what does it mean and now we will take the plain text and we will use the algorithm together with the key to turn it into a cipher text. So if we'll open up a text file and let's write down Fortinet secret key. And now let's um, save it. Let's save the file as Fortinet. Let's open it again, just to make sure that we have the plain text and now let's use OpenSSL let's use AES 128 AES is a symmetric encryption algorithm in our case we are using a key space of 128 bits that is 2 to the power of 128 and let's insert the 40 net text and let's output a cipher text let's call it cipher fortinet we are asked to insert a password the password is not the key the password is part of the key derivation so let's enter the password let's enter it again and now we have a cipher text let's look at the cipher text we have called the cipher text cipher fortnet and there it is that's the encrypted plain text
All right, so here we are at the top five diagnostics command for your 48. And we start with the first command, which may look a bit simple, which is the get system, get system status. Now, this command is very basic, but it gives you a lot of information, it gives you the virus and IPS database version, it gives you the serial number of your FortiGate. You can tell if you have a hard disk or are you using only a flash memory. It also tells you are you participating in an HA cluster or not. It gives you information of the operation mode. Are you working in a NAT mode or maybe a transparent mode? Are you using another virtual domain or are you using only one virtual domain? So a lot of information in that simple command. The second command is the get hardware nick and the interface name. In our case, let's look at the our when interface. Sorry, it's when one. And that tells you of each interface, its MAC address. Does it support any uh, hardware acceleration? In our case, it's, we support MP4 Lite. Uh, do you have any drop pack, dropped packets in your interface? Is the status up or down? Uh, are you working in a full duplex or maybe half duplex? And what is the speed of your interface? In our case, it's one gig. Our third command is the get system performance status. Now, personally, I love that command since it tells you a lot of your 48. Now, at the top output, you will see uh, how many CPUs your 48 model supports. The following thing is the RAM usage. And at the bottom, the output shows your network traffic, uh, the amount of average sessions per minute, and so on. So you have your CPU usage, you have your RAM usage, and your network usage. Next up is probably one of the most known when you deal with the Fortinet firewall, and that is the Diagnose Debug Flow, which actually shows you the flow of your traffic from the CPU perspective. So um, you have to enable it. Let's enable. And then you use the diagnose debug flow. You use usually use filters since if you are not filtering your traffic, there could be tons of traffic that will be shown on your command line and it won't be so easy to analyze. So let's let's filter a specific address which is the 10.0.3.16 and now the next thing to do is to diagnose debug flow and trace and let's use a count of 10, 10 packets to show and it shows us tons of information from the specific source host that we have chosen to just about anywhere that the traffic flows. It shows us the source net and the destination net, and it shows us the policy that is being used. A great tool for debugging and troubleshooting. All right, now the next command is the dive sys session list, which shows you the sessions, the sessions that are being handled on your FortiGate. And that also shows us tons of information. You can see the different protocols that are being used. You can also use it using specific filters or wrapping different source um, address. And that will show you a limited portion of the information uh, that is relevant towards a specific host only. And 
our last command is the diag system which is similar to the top command in Linux and that shows you each and every process in your 48 it shows you the process name the process ID it shows you its state is it asleep or maybe it is running it shows you how how much memory is being consumed and how much CPU is being consumed. Whenever you have issues with one of the processes in your 48, that is probably one of the first places to check. And before we end this video, please don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>
Hey everyone, so you have your 48 and its switchboard includes physical ports. Each can be configured with its own IP address or be associated to a virtual switch, either a soft switch or a hardware switch. That is, we are actually creating switches within the physical switch board. But what is the difference between a soft switch and a hardware switch? Well, the difference is that in soft switch, the implementation itself is done at the software level and not on the hardware level. That is similar to saying, okay, port one, port two, port three, you all belong to a soft switch that we will name it marketing and it will have an IP address of 10.0.0 and so on. In a virtual hardware switch, the implementation is done over the physical ports themselves, where each port, each interface is configured in its hardware level to be a part of the same hardware switch. A much superior way to handle traffic and in terms of performance it makes a huge difference. Now whenever traffic enters the switch and it is destined to one of the interfaces that belong to that switch Decisions are made by the physical switch itself, its forwarding table, which is actually the MAC table. All right, so let's configure a hardware virtual switch. All right, so let's move over to our command line. Config system virtual switch. And now, if I'll type the get command, uh, I will see that currently I don't have any um, virtual switch already configured. So let's name one. Let's call our virtual switch. Let's call it marketing. And let's um, set it up from the physical switchboard. All right. And now let's config the different ports that will uh, make out this switch. So let's use internal 4 and let's use internal 5 also and let's use internal 6.
All right. Let's get back to our. All right. So now let's let's use the same command as before. Config system switch. Sorry, config system virtual switch. And let's see if we have a switch that is configured. Yes, we have. Here's our marketing switch. All right, now let's refresh our interface pane to see our new virtual switch. And there it is. Now, if we will head over to our setting page of that switch, we can configure its IP address, its management. Uh, let's, let's use uh, LAN2 as our alias. And let's get him an IP address. And let's, uh, that's right, I'm using the same. Let's uh, allow anyone to connect to it using HTTP and HTTPS. And let's allow ping also. And every, every device, every appliance that will connect to that subnet will get an IP from its DHCP server. And let's also add up device detection. Okay. And there we have it. We have a hardware virtual switch with its own subnet, with its own DHCP server, any plans that will connect to it will get uh, an IP address from its pool, and any traffic that will head up to one of the interfaces that is within the marketing switch will be forwarded using the uh, forwarding table.
One of the coolest features of your 48 is its ability to packet capture just about any traffic that flows from different sources towards different destinations. Now you can capture packets using two ways. The first one is using the GUI itself in network packet capture and you can enable different filters but the way that I like is the TCP dump way that is doing it in the command line interface and I didn't mention TCP dumped for nothing the syntax is very similar now if you use the GUI option you can import the results into a pickup file and then open it in Wireshark but we will use the CLI way as I find it much more quicker to analyze so the basic syntax for uh, capturing packets is the diagnose command and then we'll use the sniffer and packet and now we will choose which interface to make the sniffing now we will not choose specific interface so we'll use the any interface we will not use any filter right now we will use it very soon the amount of verbosity the amount of details which we will use is 4 packet count will be 10 and we'll also use a timestamp using the a command now let's open it so we can see it much clearer and we can see that we have action in our when one interface with a source of 10.0.3.139 towards the 48 uh, appliance itself which is in the 10.0.3.16 we have different uh, tcp packets using different flags and we will use uh, a specific filter that will define the uh, if we can see any action that is being done using the ICMP protocol. If we will use the same command without the A at the end, we will get uh, the same results but without the timestamp. So use it when troubleshooting packets. Now, if we'll want to use, let's add the A, if we'll want to use um, a specific filter as in the ICMP protocol, so we will see that once we enter the name of the protocol and take a good notice, we have only 10 packets that are being shown. We can also use 20 packets and we will have 20 packets we can use many filters in our command now you can look at the fortinet documentary to see which filters are available when doing packet capture but the most used are uh, source and destination we can uh, determine specific host and specific protocols so if we we'll use the diagnose sniffer packet any we can use host uh, 10.0.3.139 which is my mac and icmp as the as the protocol that i'm looking for and we will use the verbosity the level 4 verbosity which is the default verbosity
One of the major keys to understand how your 48 works is to understand how it handles session, how it handles the dialogue between clients and servers. Now, 48 is a session aware firewall. We all know the get system session list which gives us an overview of the sessions that are currently running on your FortiGate between different clients towards different destination we can also see the source net we can see which protocol is being used another well-known command is the diagsys session list which we can also filter based on the uh, host IP or destination IP but I would like to show you another command which I'm not sure that is uh, that popular which is the get system session info full stat Now let's make the screen a bit bigger. Now what we can see in that command is the session table size, that is the uh, current session table size, the number of entries that is possible in the session table. Another thing we can see is how many sessions are being used right now. In our case, we have 64 sessions that are being used right now. The session count is the number of sessions in the kernel. Now we can also see several more things. We can see the memory tension drop. That is the number of dropped sessions due to system that is running out of memory. Another very interesting information that we can find is the ephemeral, which is actually a buffer that protects our table, our session table, from getting overloaded. That is, if a denial of service attack is happening. Now, the first number is the amount of sessions that are in use. The second number is the maximum number that is allowed. Now, if we can, if we see that uh, both numbers are very close, then there is a, a good indication that a denial of service is actually happening on your organization. The other thing that we can see is the TCP sessions. Now, looking at the TCP sessions, we can see their state. Each session has a different state. So we can see that we have 11 sessions in established state. That is, they have finished the three-way handshake connection. The connection now is established and they can transfer data. We can also see that we have one session that is in a time-wait state. Now, the time-wait state is a special state that happens 
when a connection termination request is sent and our FortiGate actually reserves some time to ensure that the remote side received the termination request. This video is all about setup tips for your FortiGate and we are starting right now. To get more easy setup tips for your 48 firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. One of the most common questions that I get every time is how do I set up my 48? I'm not interested currently in any intrusion prevention system sensors. I'm not interested in IPsec VPNs. I just have several interfaces connected to different clans and I need to set up my FortiGate for a, truly a basic operation. So in this video we will look at the basic, basic setup configuration. Uh, as you know in my channel you have tons of videos that deals with different aspects of your 48. So the very first thing is to um, set up your administrative profile. You are probably the super admin of your 48. So make sure that you connect through trusted host. Uh, if you need up to set up a new admin, maybe a professional admin that will be responsible for another virtual domain or different aspects of your FortiGate, do it. So the next thing to do is to move over to network interfaces. You probably have different LANs connected to different interfaces in your FortiGate. In each interface, don't forget to write down an alias. It will help identifying which LAN belongs to which interface. Use a specific roles for specific interfaces. Use administrative protocols carefully. Don't just let anyone ping from that interface if it is not needed. Use DHCP server and use DHCP server scopes so you can create different DHCP options for that local area network. You can block specific MAC addresses from receiving IP addresses. Uh, and use device detection and active scanning. You want to know which devices initiate traffic on that interface. Now the next thing to do is to create or configure a static route that will lead to your ISP. Now it is usually uh, created using the default route, which actually means uh, that any packet that is destined to anywhere and it does not have any entry in the routing table, should head up towards the specific gateway, which is usually the WAN gateway. The next thing to do is policy and objects. That is the bread and butter of your 48 firewall. It is where you create rules, rules that match any traffic that comes in or gets out of your 40 gate. Assuming that it matches the traffic, you have two decisions. The first one is to accept, the second one is to deny. Now you can create different policies according to different topologies. The basic, the basic policy is the full access policy which allows local area network to get out to the internet through the WAN interface. So incoming interface can be just about any LAN in your uh, network. The outgoing is the WAN interface source can be different users devices but let's assume that we deal with just about anyone destination also can be specific destination but let's assume that any destination is allowed you can set up different scheduling and services now 
again you can deny specific protocols but for our case we will allow any service now the learn policy is another topic that i have made a video specifically on that but that's not the issue right now now whenever Foligate matches the traffic the next decisions are are we uh, going to log the traffic are we going to net the traffic net is also uh, very uh, i would say not difficult but it is a tough topic to understand uh, and then it implies the security profiles which can be antivirus web filtering ips and so on and our last setup is actually moving on to the login report and see whatever happens in your 40 gig. now there's a lot of happening whenever traffic comes in and gets out whenever an admin logs in into one of the interfaces whenever there's a vpn tunnel that initiates or stops working you need to uh, maximize your understanding on what is happening on your network and the best thing to do is to look at the login report and understand your network baseline for years, it is known mostly as the number one web application vulnerability, SQL injection, when a user input becomes an attack vector. Don't go anywhere. To get more easy setup tips for your 48 firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. To understand SQL injection attack, we have to go back to the basic. So we have a web app, it runs on our browser, and just about any web app has different input fields that we enter user credentials or we enter reviews or just about anything, comments and so on. Whenever we do it, our web server that hosts the web app contacts its database. It does so using a very specific language which is called SQL. SQL is actually a structured query language, a special language that allows us as users and allows our web server to update, to delete, or to request information from the database. To do so, our web app sends SQL statements to the server. Now you can send a batch of SQL statements. There is a group of two or more SQL statements that are separated by semicolon the server processes our request and returns back the results up until now fantastic it works just fine now where is the vulnerability when our web app just doesn't sanitize it doesn't sanitize our user input it doesn't differentiate between plain text that is used as the user input and an SQL statement that is entered in the input field and sent to the database. Let's look more closely. When we have a user input, the code, the application code looks something similar to that. When we enter our name, that is our username, it is being added to the code itself. Now imagine what will happen if I enter the following code instead of my name. It is actually an SQL statement that was entered in our input field. So now our application code looks like that. Offer, which is my username, or 1 equals 1. Now the database pulls down the records for every user. 
wherever 1 equals 1. Remember, 1 equals 1 is always true. The SQL is actually a valid SQL statement and it will return all rows from the user's table since OR1 equals 1 is always true. So our pure plain SQL statement is being treated as any other text input it is being injected directly into our database and from there the opportunity for a malicious attacker is huge.
Welcome to our 48 top 5 tips and this time we are dealing with the ping command. Tip number 1. When we use the ping command we use the execute command so we'll use the execute ping and we'll choose our destination as 8888 which is Google's DNS server. Now we can see that our ping size is 56 bytes and Fortigate gate sends five packets at a time. Now we can change the size of our ping. How do we do it? We use the execute ping options. Let's view the settings. All right, and now if we will use the execute ping options, data size, we can choose ICMP packets to be in different size. Uh, let's choose 90. So now our ping size is 90 bytes. Let's choose the same target. Execute ping towards 8888. And you can see that our ping size is 90 bytes. And to our second tip, now if you do networking for a long time, you probably send continuous ping packets towards different destination, different interface. So you have to change the amount of packets to be continuous or to be at a different size than the five packets that are sent by default. How do we do it? We use the execute ping options and we use a different repeat count. Currently the repeat count is 5. Now let's change it to 15. And now let's ping again and let's ping the Google DNS server and let's see how many packets are being sent. And we can see that we have 15 packets that are sent. And now for our third tip, let's clear that out. Now we have different interfaces in our 48 and sometimes we wish to send ping packets from different interfaces. So how do we do it? I have currently a an interface at the 10.0.4.1 so let's let's use the same execute ping options and now let's choose a different source in my case it's the 10.0.4.1 and now if I'll use the same ping command the packets will be sent from the 10.0.4.1 Moving on to tip number four. Usually a ping command is being discarded after 64 hopes. Now we can choose a different integer. We can choose an integer between one and 255 hopes. How do we do it? We use the same, sorry for that. We use the same execute ping options time to live and let's choose 220 hopes 220 hopes and now our ping packet will be discarded only after 220 hopes all right and now let's move over to our fifth tip sometimes as an administrator you use different settings let's change the settings of our um, ping command. Let's use a repeat count of 8. Let's use a different data size. Let's make our ping size 80 bytes and let's use a different source. All right, let's use the 10.0.4.1 as our source. Now if we will use the view settings 
we will see that our repeat count is 8, our data size is 80, and our source address is the 10.0.4.1. Now, you want to reset this, the, those settings. What do you do? You use the reset command. And now if we'll take a look at the view settings, we will see that it all came back to the default settings, which are five packets, 56 bytes, and the source is the according to the interface that you work within. Now, if you like our channel, please subscribe. In this video, I'm going to show you the five top routing commands for your 48, and we are starting right now. Welcome to our top five commands, and this time it's all about routing. Your 48 is not only a next generation firewall, it is also an OSI layer 3 device, just like any other professional router. So let's start right now. And the first command, our first command will be the get router info routing table. And now there are two variants of that command. You can see the full routing table, including the inactive routes. That's the a full routing table including inactive routes and you can see only the active routes and there we use the all with our command our next command um, which is very useful whenever we wish to see more details on a specific destination we can use the get router info routing table. Now we'll use the details for our destination and this one it's going to be the default route and we can see that when we ask for the default routes we get two static routes. We get one from the WAN2 interface and its IP address is the 10.0.5.2 and the second one which is actually the active one, is the one from our WAN 1 interface at the 10.0.3.1. We can also see the different administrative distance. The active one has an administrative distance of 10. The inactive one has an administrative distance of 20. There are times when you have two static routes to the same destination, both static routes have the same priority, have the same administrative distance, and you wish to load balance uh, the traffic between them. 48 load balances the traffic automatically, but the load balance algorithm can change. So let's change our two static routes to be within the same priority and administrative distance. Let's look at the both. They are in the routing table, in the active routing table, and yes they are. And now let's config system setting. Sorry for that. It always happens. And set v4 ECMP mode. ECMP is equal cost multi path. That says actually that whenever we have two static routes using the same priority and administrative distance, 48 will load balance the traffic. How will it load the, the traffic? Well, there are actually four different algorithms uh, using the same source IP, using an interface weight, usage that is whenever 
on one interface you get into a specific threshold the traffic moves to another interface and you can also use the same destination and source IP and now we move on to our fourth command which is the link health monitor link health monitor is a mechanism that protects your 48 from a route fail over now assume that your 48 has two isp connections isp1 and isp2 the first connection which is when one connection is active since it has a lower distance the second static route is not active now whenever 48 notices that the route through when one is not working anymore it uh, transfers or it makes the second route the second static route it makes it active it makes it active so it can route the traffic to the internet how do we do it we use a uh, link health monitor config system link monitor edit that is the name of the link health monitor set the source interface and now set the server that is the server that we will probe uh, it can be 8888 which is Google's DNS server or any other stable server set the gateway IP now set the protocol it can be a, using ping or it can use um, TCP echo or UDP echo and then set the update static route to enable moving on to our last command which is the diagnose firewall p route list now this command actually shows us the policy based routes table now you can create a policy based route which is a much granular way to create routes using the policy routes under the network menu use it when use it carefully and use it only when you have a very specific needs from your route entry
Hey everyone, so you have your 48 and its switchboard includes physical ports. Each can be configured with its own IP address or be associated to a virtual switch, either a soft switch or a hardware switch. That is, we are actually creating switches within the physical switchboard. But what is the difference between a soft switch and a hardware switch? Well, the difference is that in soft switch, the implementation itself is done at the software level and not on the hardware level. That is similar to saying, okay, port one, port two, port three, you all belong to a soft switch that we will name it marketing and it will have an IP address of 10.0.0 and so on. In a virtual hardware switch, the implementation is done over the physical ports themselves, where each port, each interface is configured in its hardware level to be a part of the same hardware switch. That is a much superior way to handle traffic and in terms of performance, it makes a huge difference. Now, whenever a traffic enters the switch and it is destined to one of the interfaces that belong to that switch, decisions are made by the physical switch itself, its forwarding table, which is actually the Mac table. All right, so let's configure a hardware virtual switch. All right, so let's move over to our command line. Config system virtual switch. And now if I'll type the get command, uh, I will see that currently I don't have any um, a virtual switch already configured. So let's name one. Let's call our virtual switch. Let's call it marketing. And let's um, set it up from the physical switchboard. All right. And now let's config the different ports that will uh, make out this switch. So let's use internal four and let's use internal let's get back to our all right so now let's let's use the same command as before config system switch Sorry, config system virtual switch and let's see if we have a switch that is configured yes we have here's our marketing switch all right now let's refresh our interface pane to see our new virtual switch and there it is. Now, if we will head over to our setting page of that switch, we can configure its IP address, its management. Uh, let's let's use um, LAN two as our alias, and let's get him an IP address and let's uh, that's right I'm using the same let's uh, allow anyone to connect to it using HTTP and HTTPS and let's allow ping also and every every device every appliance that will connect to that subnet will get an ip from its dhcp server 
And let's also add up device detection. Okay. And there we have it. We have a hardware virtual switch with its own subnet, with its own DHCP server. Any plants that will connect to it will get uh, an IP address from its pool. And any traffic that will head up to one of the interfaces that is within the marketing switch will be forwarded using the uh, forwarding table. Let me show you the best user setting tips for your FortiGate, and we start right now. To get more easy setup tips for your FortiGate firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. So you have your users connected to one of the interfaces in your 48 and you want to set up different settings as authentication timeout and so on. So head over to the command line, config user settings and the first command is set auto timeout. Let's move over between the different uh, options. And there you can choose different integers from one minute up to 24 hours. Now the default is five minutes. Personally, I prefer to set the timeout to 30 minutes. So choose whatever suits you as an administrator and your company's policy. The second command is quite important. Set out of timeout type. Now there are different types of authentication timeout. There's the idle timeout, the hard timeout, and the new session timeout. What is the difference? In an idle timeout, FortiGate has to see traffic that is coming from the user. If it doesn't see traffic coming from the user's IP address for the time we configured as the authentication timeout, well, it deletes the authentication entry and asks the user to authenticate again. Now, in a hard 
timeout. It doesn't matter if there is a traffic or not. After the authentication timeout passed, the user will be asked to authenticate again. That's a hard timeout. The last option, new session timeout. Well, that's the case where you have a timeout. Let's say it's five minutes. You head over to a site. You start to download a file. Now, after five minutes, the file download is not terminated. It still goes up and downloads to your computer. But if you head over to another site, that is, you create a new session, you will be asked to authenticate. Another option that every administrator needs to configure is the amount of failed attempts before the user is being blocked. That is the number of time a user can fail authentication until it is being blocked. Now, the default is currently five. You can change it up to 100 times. I usually use three times. So that is set of invalid maximum. That is the maximum number of invalid login attempts and let's set it to three. Some of your user will probably head over through a captive portal, that is outsource employees and so on. So you can set the set auto portal timeout, that is the amount of time that those employees will need to authenticate again uh, to an integer of between one up to 30 minutes.
One of the key elements of any authentication scheme is the usage of passwords. We use passwords all over in our 48. We use it when we configure new users. We use it when we configure our admin profiles. We also use it when we configure SSL or IPsec VPNs we use passwords all over. We will look at password entropy, how random or how difficult it is to predict your password. Let's start. So an entropy in plain words is the difficulty in guessing a password, either in a brute force attack or a dictionary attack. Now, how do you calculate entropy? Well, you do it using the length of your password, the complexity of your password. Are you using uppercase characters, lowercase, or maybe you're using uppercase and lowercase? Are you using symbols? Are you using numbers? The more complex your password is, there is much more entropy. And the last parameter is the randomness of your password. The more random it is, it adds up more entropy. Now, randomness is an issue when it comes to computers since computers can actually generate a pseudo random numbers. All right, so let's look at an entropy example and things will be much more clear. So we are calculating entropy using the following formula. H equals L. L is the length of your password. H is the total binary bits of an entropy. Entropy is calculated using bits. And N is the number of possible symbols in a password. So a password length of eight characters 
from the entire alphabet, that is uppercase, lowercase symbols and numbers, will get us to an entropy of 2 to the 52. So this password has about 52 bits of entropy and it is a strong password. The higher your password entropy, the less predictable your password patterns are for a computer. As far as password, 36, 37 bits of entropy are rather good. Another example is when we use a key lock that has only 10 digits, that is 0 to 9. So if we use only 5 characters, you know what, if we use 4 characters, we usually use 4 characters as our passwords in a, a Panlock keypad. So that is 10 to the power of 4. 10 to the power of 4 is 10,000. So the key space of the password is 10,000 passwords. If we use 5 characters out of the 10 digits, it is 10 to the power of 5, which is uh, only 100,000 passwords. And the entropy is only 16 bits. So this is not a good password in the digital world. It may be a good one in the physical world. If we use only lower letters uh, in the English alphabet, we have 26 letters in the English alphabet, and we use a password of seven characters. That is 26 to the power of seven, it gets us to a total of 8.3 billion passwords. The entropy there is 32 bits only, so still it is not a good password. If we use uh, 8 characters out of the 26, that is 26 to the power of 8, we have 208 billion possibilities, that's the key space, the entropy is 37, which is quite good, though nowadays we use passwords with a more complexity, that is using the uppercase and the lowercase, plus numbers and symbols.
We can use the command line to diagnose and learn more of our SD1 member interface. Coming up. To get more easy setup tips for your 48 firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. We can use our command line while configuring SD1 for uh, different tasks. One of them is to use uh, different protocols that will be used uh, towards uh, the server that was chosen in the health check. So if we look at the performance SLA, let's choose one. And we can see that on the graphical user interface, we only have two options to actually to ping our server that is using ping and HTTP. Now, if we will use the command line, config sys virtual WAN link, config health check, now let's edit the performance SLA that we have chosen, that is uh, SIP. Let's see uh, what is chosen. Show full configuration. And we can see that the protocol that was chosen is ping. Let's set protocol. And now you can see that we have the ping option, the TCP echo option, the UDP echo option, HTTP, and TWAM. So that is something that is available on the command line and not on the GUI interface. Another thing that we can do or actually see using our command line, let's use the uh, diag sys virtual WAN link. Let's choose, um, let's choose again, let's choose the SIP can't see it that way. Let's choose the um, SIP health check. Now we can see the status of each uh, member in our um, SD-WAN, in our virtual SD-WAN interface. Uh, in terms of packet loss, we can also see it on the graphical user interface, but that is also a one way to look at the different members we can see that it is alive we can see that we have no issues currently with packet loss uh, and we can see the statistics for latency and jitter currently the other members are not alive uh, since uh, i have not enabled them on my uh, 48. Now, whenever we use performance SLA, we are actually telling our 48 to probe different services. We can configure up to two servers um, uh, that will be used as beacons. We are doing that to check the status, the health of the different members of the SD1 interface. Now, whenever our 48 probes that server it is actually using a route entry that is created let's see that route entry so we will use the get router info kernel uh, and those entries are actually flagged uh, they are created uh, in the uh, kernel they are called fib entries and they are flagged as proto 17. So to see them, we will use the grep command and we will use the proto equals 17. And we can see, let's uh, make that a bit bigger. We can see um, the um, different routes uh, they are being sent from the different uh, interface gateway towards the different servers that we have chosen. The first one was actually uh, the Google DNS server, which is 8888. And the second one is 1111. <laughs> 
Hey everyone, so here we are at part 4 of Certificate Operations in your Fortigate. This video series spreads some light on the importance of certificates and why do we use them. It is not a tutorial of how to create a self-signed certificate. We will get to that. It is actually the theory behind digital certificates. So what did we have? We had symmetric encryption where the two parties share the same secret key. We also learned of asymmetric encryptions where we use a key pair, a public and a private key, different keys yet related mathematically. And then we had at part three, we had hash functions, a one-way function that takes any input and transform it into a digest, a hash value that is not reversible and is collusion free. That is, no two different inputs can produce the same hash value. All right, so let's connect the dots. A CA, which is a certificate authority, issues digital certificates. This digital certificate also contain the public key of the entity who requested the digital certificate. It can be just about any web server out there. Another thing that it does is signing the digital certificate. How it does so? It hashes the digital certificate along with the public key and then encrypts it using its private key, using the CA's private key. Now, when a browser connects to a secure web server, it gets the certificate along with a digital signature. Think about it as two different files. It opens the digital signature using the public key of the CA. It has the public key of the CA in its certificate root directory. Now, any browser keeps its certificates, its CA certificates, in a different place. Now, as the file is being decrypted, he gets the hash of the digital certificate value. He then takes the digital certificate, the original one, hashes it using the same hash algorithm that was used by the CA. The type of the algorithm is also present on the certificate itself. We can see it right here. If both hash values are the same, then we have a proof that the entity who sent the certificate is the one who it claims to be. So we have used asymmetric encryption and hash functions to prove the authenticity of the entity. Now, the two parties, the browser and the web server, will negotiate the symmetric encryption that will be used as the encryption algorithm, the cipher itself, to encrypt the communication between them. We saw that we can list processes, sort them out, and even terminate them whenever they demand too much resources. On our last part of knowing your processes, we will see how we can, in one CLI command, see the topmost CPU demanding processes. <music> To get more easy setup tips for your 48 firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. One of the features that we saw using the DAG system command is that we can list the most demanding uh, processes, either CPU and memory using the M and the P character when it is pressed. Now, there is another command 
which is the get system performance top which lists only uh, the most demanding CPU processes. Let's see it in action. So we use the get sys, sorry for that, get sys performance top. Now you will see the most demanding processes, the most CPU demanding processes at the second most right column, that's the CPU column. The most right column is, as we know, the memory column. Now you will see different processes such as the IPS engine or the antivirus scanner, the new CLI or even the SSHD the SSH daemon. Now, whenever a process is too demanding in terms of CPU, you may need to kill that process and we saw how to do it using the diag sys kill with a signal level and the process ID. Whenever you open an app in your 48, you're actually creating a process. A process is responsible to ask the kernel for resources. CPU resources, RAM resources. How do you manage them? Using the diagsys top command. Let's take a look. To get more easy setup tips for your 48 firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. There are some different ways to sort up the processes that are running on your 48, but one of the most popular diagnose command is the diagsys top command. Now, whenever you launch the diagsys command, you will see the different processes that are currently running on your 48. Now, you can filter those processes using the diagsys top. And now you can set up a number, an integer, that will actually behave as the interval between the processes and the amount of processes that you wish to see. I've chosen 5 and 20 processes. So I have 20 processes and the interval that they will refresh is 5 seconds. Now let's take a look at the information that is being shown here. Let me stop just to look at those processes without interfering. So what I have here is the name of the process. New CLI is the JavaScript command line, HTTPS, the DNS proxy, and so on. I also have the process ID, which I may use if I wish to kill that process. I have the state of the process, which can be a process that is running, as this one or a process that is asleep. Moving on to the two more pieces of information that we have. The first one is the amount of CPU that the process is using. And the second one is the amount of memory that the process is using. Now, you will also see above the processes some gibberish such as the 99i. What does it mean? It actually means that currently the CPU is currently 99 idle. So there aren't many processes that consume the CPU resource. You can also see the amount of free memory that our 48 has. That is the number that comes with the F character on the right. And lastly, the 1S actually means the percent of system processes that are using CPU. 
in other words, that is actually the CPU usage in percent of system processes. That's the overall information that we get using the DAG system. But how do we kill processes? And how do we toggle between processes that consume more CPU or more memory? That is coming up in the next video. <laughs>so your access points have been deployed how can you limit the amount of clients that will connect to your access point to a specific access point client limitation is crucial whenever you have high density deployments and you want your clients to move between access point whenever there is a good signal strength between them and an adjacent access point. Well, you can limit the threshold, you can limit the amount of clients. It can be 10, 20, 30 clients per access point. But you can also control the threshold, the load balancing threshold. So whenever a client has enough signal strength to another access point, it will roam to that access point. Let's see how we do it. All right, so let's use our command line to enable the access point handoff to limit the number of clients to that access point and to configure a threshold. So let's config the wireless controller, WTP profile, there it is, and let's use one of the default profiles which is the 11N only. Let's config the radio and let's set the access point handoff to enable. All right, and now Let's move back and configure the handoff station threshold and limit it to only 15 clients. So only 15 clients will connect to that access point before the load balancing mechanism will start to work. And the last thing to do is to set the handoff RSSI. And let's use a handoff RSSI of 30. Now, in the case where our clients will try to connect to our access point, the controller, our 40 gate that serves as a controller, will signal the client to connect to another access point.
One of the key topics that you will master using your 48 firewall is policies. So what is a policy? Why do we need policies and how do we configure policies? Well, a policy is a rule. A rule that when a traffic flows from one interface to the other, it matches different patterns of the traffic. It matches the interface that the traffic comes from, the destination interface that the traffic is heading towards. It also matches the source of the traffic, its IP address, its, if it belongs to a user or a user group, if it belongs to a specific device it can be a PC it can be a smartphone and when done when traffic matches your rules your specific patterns then the policy takes the security profiles action which is an intensive process that looks into the payload itself and looks for different patterns to identify the traffic, to look for viruses, to look for anomalies. We will look at IPS and antivirus later on. And then when all goes well, the policy decides whether to net the traffic and whether to log it. Policy is actually a three-step procedure. Let's look at a very simple policy. We will create one now. Now on our policy, the first part is the part where we look for matching traffic. Let's name our policy. Let's call it full access. 
And let's decide that we wish to allow any user that sits on a specific LAN. It can be your marketing division LAN, it can be your finance LAN. Each LAN will probably have a different subnet to get out to the int to the internet the, over the outgoing interface, which is our WAN interface. Our WAN interface is the interface that is connected to our ISP. Now, in terms of source, we will allow any source to get out to the internet. We can also limit it to specific users or different user group. We can create a user or a user group using the plus sign. We can also limit the traffic to a specific device. So if we, for example, want only Linux devices to get out to the internet, we can limit it to a Linux PC. Now, we will not do it. As for destination, we are not limiting. We will let anyone get out to any destination, but we can limit the destination towards a specific address. As for scheduling, we can limit our policy to work on a specific day, on a specific hour, but we will not do it. Uh, anyone can get out to the internet always. And the last part of the first um, step in our policy procedure is the service. We can limit the service to be HTTP, HTTPS, or any other service, any other uh, protocol that we wish to limit our users, but we will not do it. Users can use just about any protocol, any service. And then we decide on the action. Are we accepting the traffic? Are we denying it? Or maybe we are using it as a learn policy. A learn policy is a very specific policy that actually triggers security profiles beneath that no one really knows that it's there. And it learns our traffic and creates a report that we can look into and see users traffic most used applications threats and so on the second part is the utm profiles we can initiate any utm profile any security profile on our policy and the third part is whether we are enabling NAT. we have seen how NAT works using a NAT overload, IP pools, or maybe central NAT. And then we decide whether we want our policy to be logged with log all sessions or only security events. That's the basics of a simple full access policy. <laughs>
If you enabled Web Application Firewall on your FortiGate, then you need to know of XSS, cross-site scripting, one of the most known and malicious attacks on web servers. More on XSS coming right now. To get more easy setup tips for your 48 firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. When you think of web apps, any web app, in its basic it is built around three components. That's the very basic. There's HTML, the markup language. There's the a programming language with, which adds interactivity into the page itself. We usually use JavaScript. And there's the CSS, which is responsible for the styling. Now, think of a web app that when a user enters an input into one of the forms, fields, or any place that uh, a user input is needed. It doesn't sanitize between a pure data, that is 
text and a malicious code. Malicious attackers use XSS for different reason. It can be a harmful reason such as changing the look and feel of the web app, its background image or color or type of font, but it can also be used to steal cookies from the user, to grab screenshots of its computer or to even insert a keylogger that will send any keystroke to a specific URL. There are actually two types of XSS attacks. The first one is reflected XSS, that is XSS attack or malicious script that is reflected on the victim's browser. And the second one is stored XSS, which is the malicious code that is stored in the web app database and is executed every time when the user calls the specific function. Now, what can you do with XSS? Well, just about anything. If you head over to XSS payloads, you can find out different JavaScript payloads that can be inserted as a malicious code on a web app field or form and can be used to capture keystrokes, can be used to take screenshots out of your screen, or even grab images from your webcam. So XSS is pure evil when it is used in the hands of the wrong man. Let's look at how the JavaScript itself looks like. So that's the JavaScript itself. Now, in most of the cases, the JavaScript code also takes the information that it grabs. It can be a screenshot from your computer or even your cookies that are being stolen and sends it to the attacker URL where they can grab it and use it against you. One very known attack is when you use XSS to steal some other users cookies and then you head over to the same website and pretend to be that user. <laughs>
Five best tips for using your antivirus within your FortiGate. The first one, choose whether to use it in a flow-based mode or a proxy-based mode. You can see that in a flow-based mode, the features are quite limited, but moving in into a proxy-based mode, you can see that you have much more options when using antivirus. The second tip, choose your database. There are actually three main databases that you can use within your FortiGate. There's a fourth one, which is a compact database, but you can use the config antivirus settings and set the different database. You can use the default database, the extended database, and in, in specific FortiGate models, there's also the extreme database, which actually includes just about any signature. Our third tip is use grayware and heuristics. Now, when you scan using antivirus, the first step is to look for known signatures. The second step is to look for grayware. Grayware is not by definition a malware. It is an unsolicited program that usually downloads to your computer without you ever knowing about it. A good example is an adware. So how do you use, how do you enable grayware? Again, config antivirus settings, set, Grayware, now you can enable or disable. My tip, always make grayware enable. All right, now for the fourth tip, use heuristics. Now, what is heuristic? Heuristics, let's just, all right. Let's config antivirus, but this time not settings, but heuristics. Now, heuristics is actually an analysis of behavior, the way a file behaves. Now, FortiGate looks for different patterns, and if the file behaves in a suspicious way, you can determine what to do with it. Now, you can set mode to pass the suspicious file, you can block the suspicious file, or you can disable the heuristic features. Now, why do you need, or why do you want to disable this feature? Because it adds up much more false positive events. So use it carefully. My fifth tip and the last tip is use hardware acceleration for antivirus scanning. Now acceleration works only on the flow based antivirus, not on the proxy one. And 48 models that features the NP4 or the NP6 can accelerate uh, the antivirus processing to enhance performance. So use it by typing in your command line config IPS global, set NPXL mode and choose none or basic. Basic actually enables the acceleration itself. And the last tip that I have for you guys is don't forget to subscribe to 40 tip. Let me show you the best application control tips for your 48 and we start right now. To get more easy setup tips for your 48 firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. Application control scans your traffic, your network traffic for applications that you wish to control. 
Now it does so using the IPS, the Intrusion Prevention System Engine, and its protocol decoders. Now the order of the operation is quite significant. The first thing it scans is the application override. That is different signatures. The second thing is filter override where you can uh, group application that have uh, the same behavior such as excessive bandwidth. And the last thing it does is scans for the different categories. So if you wish to block a category such as gaming, and yet you wish to enable a specific game such as the Battlefield game, you can do it. And let's just select the signature. And 48 will start by scanning application override it will see that the uh, battlefield game is let's make it allow let's make it a monitor in monitor mode it will allow the game still it will monitor it uh, keep logs of it and then it will look for the filter overrides currently we don't have anything in the filter overrides and then it will look at the categories where it will block any other game when the IPS engine finds a match to an application, it tells your FortiGate that it found an application ID number. Now, FortiNet keeps a database of some thousands of applications. Each one has its own ID. If you wish to see the different IDs for the different application, you use the CLI. Config application list edit zero, config entries, edit zero, and then set application and a question mark. And now you can scroll between the different applications and their ID. The next tip may seem obvious, but I have seen cases where users um, created application control sensor and believe that it is globally enabled on any firewall policy. Well, that's not the case. Whenever you create an application sensor, name it and then use it in your different policies and the application sensor will be available only through that policy alone. Whenever you as an administrator block an application, don't forget that your users deserve an explanation why that application was blocked. So for an HTTP based application, you can use the replacement messages for HTTP based application. Make sure that it is enabled. Now, when you enable it, your users will get a block page that will include the following information. Uh, the signature that detected the application, the signatures category, either gaming or peer-to-peer, -peer, the URL that was specifically blocked, the client source, that's the IP address of the client, and the server's destination. Now, another thing that the block page includes is the 48's host name and the UUID of the policy that was governing the traffic. It is good in an organization that you have many 48 devices. You can look up at the host name of the 48 and tell which 48 actually blocked the traffic. Now our last tip, which we will include a specific video on it in the coming future, is traffic shaping. You can actually traffic shape any application and allocate guaranteed bandwidth or maximum bandwidth to that specific application. It can be your 
Netflix or whichever application you use the most. Now you, you configure a traffic shaper and you configure a traffic shaping policy. That traffic shaping policy can be determined on a specific policy and specific categories such as video and audio where you can actually select different applications such as the Netflix application.
48 captive portal in 3 minutes. Here's how. To get more easy setup tips for your 48 firewall, subscribe now and don't forget to click on the bell notification and you won't miss anything. So you have outsource employees connected to one of your interfaces and you wish to restrict the access to the network. What do you do? You use Captive Portal. How? Here's how. The first thing to do is to create a new user group, a user group that is dedicated to those outsource employees. So let's create one, let's use the guest as our user group, and let's use email as a method to deliver the password for that captive portal. The expiration of the account is four hours, but you can change it. That's the first step. The second thing to do is to create an administrator that is responsible only for the provisioning of the guest accounts. So let's use uh, my name, let's use a password. And let's restrict that admin for guest accounts for the outsource employees. Now, the third thing to do is to head over to that interfaces that our employees will connect through. And let's move over to the security mode. Let's choose, usually it is none. Now, we will use captive portal. We will restrict it to that outsource employee group. And we finish the third step. Let's create a policy that will allow outsource employees to get into the network and outsource EMP. The incoming interface is the interface of the outsource employees. The outgoing is our when. Source will be all and will be outsource employee user group. Destination is all. Service is all. All right, now let's log out and let's get into the new admin page that will allow us to create password for those employees. Now let's use my email and 48 will generate a password that we can print it out or send it via email. Now, if we log out again and enter with our user, our super admin credentials, we will see that in our user group, we already have one member, which is the member that we have sent the password to that email. <laughs>
Hey everyone, this is the second part of how certificates work. We will unleash the mystery of certificate and in this part we will look at asymmetric encryption. Well, asymmetric encryption works using a key pair. Two different keys that are related mathematically. Now, one key which is the private key, should be kept safe. That's the secret key. The second key is a public key. Anyone can use it. Anyone can look at it. You can encrypt using the private key or using the public key. You cannot encrypt and decrypt using the same key. You have to use the second key pair in order to encrypt or decrypt. Now we will look at OpenSSL and how do we generate a key pair. One is, one is a private key and the second one is the public key. But the beauty, the beauty of asymmetric encryption or using a key pair is the fact that they're not only used in encryption. They are also used to authenticate the identity of the second peer. A server that wishes to have a digital certificate must generate a key peer. It must generate a public key and a private key. There are different algorithms that uh, will allow it to do so. We will use RSA. Now we'll use OpenSSL, uh, Gen RSA, and let's name our um, our key pair. Let's name it Forty Key, and let's contain it uh, in a PM uh, format, which is a container that will include both keys. And let's decide that the size of the keys will be 2048 bit. And that's about it. Now, if we wish to see the both the public key and the private key to inspect them individually, we can do so using the following command. Open SSL. RSA, let's insert the file that we have just created, 40key.pm, and let's get the public key out of it. And let's name it mykey.pub. All right, it's writing it. Let's see how it looks. Let's open the Key. and that's our uh, public key. Now if we wish to see the private key we can use the following command and that's the private key. So we have a public key and a private key and those two are used when a server requests a certificate using a certificate signing request, it sends the public key as a part of its information. We will look later on how a certificate authority takes that information and actually creates a digital certificate plus a digital signature that will prove that he or it is the one that it claims to be. Hey everyone, back to Fortigate Certificate and in this part three, we will look at hash functions. Now what is a hash function? A hash function is a mathematical function that takes any input and produces a hash value. 
Now, the hash value is always in a fixed size according to the hash function that was used. The hash value is also called a digest and it should be impossible to produce the same value for two different inputs. So the function is actually collusion free. Now a hash function must be quick. It has to produce the hash value very fast and a slight change on the input should change the entire hash value completely. So even if we have a one gigabyte file full of text and we change a comma in one of the sentences, the hash value will change completely. So we have the input, we have the hash function, and we have the digest, the hash value. Now, when do we use it? We use it for integrity. Whenever we send a file, it can be just about any file, and we want to check its integrity, that no one touched it, no one tampered with the bitstream. We make a hash value out of the file, and then on the other side, we compare the same file using the same hash function. If the two hash values are the same, then no one tampered with the file. If the hash value changes, then someone probably touched the file. There are dozens of hash functions that are used just about anywhere. When a web server stores uh, passwords in its database, they are being hashed. They are being hashed using different hash functions such as the SHA-256 or the SHA-512. To make the hash stronger, we also use what is known as a SALT. We generate a random numbers to be added to the password itself and thus the uh, hash value will be much more difficult to guess. Now, now the term guessing is the right term since hashes are in no way an encryption technique. They are not used for encryption. They are only a mathematical function, a one-way mathematical function that takes an input turns it into another value and there's no way back. They are not reversible. All right, so enough, enough with that. Let's move over to OpenSSL. Let's uh, reproduce some hashes out of different inputs. And at the end, that will probably be part four of the series we will recap what we have learned uh, by now that is symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption and hash functions and we will look at certificate, a digital certificate and understand how it all matches. All right, so we'll use OpenSSL but let's start out by using the echo command and let's write down some text. I have a secret message. All right, now let's grab it into OpenSSL and let's use uh, MD5. MD5 is a hash function that produces a 128 bit value. Now that's the uh, hash uh, value of that text. Now if I'll use the same if I'll use this same text, but I'll add, I'll change the E to an A, you'll see that I get another hash value, completely different hash value. Let's go back to the same uh, text and it will produce the same hash value as before. Now, if we will use the SHA-256 hash function, 
you can see that we actually get the output as a 256-bit value. It is much stronger than MD5. We can also do it using the 512-bit, which produces stronger hash value. Now, how does it all have to do with digital certificate and digital signatures? We will look at it in our next video, which will be the last part of the series. But let's just look out at a digital certificate. And as you can see, we have the public key, which is the asymmetric encryption. We also have a signature algorithm, which is the hash function, as we just spoke about. And in part four, we will see how it all mixes out with the symmetric encryption to make sure that we have confidentiality, authenticity, and integrity. One of the toughest topics to understand when we deal with security appliance is probably the world of certificates, a digital certificates. Why? Because Understanding certificates means that you have to understand what is asymmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, and hash functions. Now, we will start with a video series that will try to lighten up the issue. And we will start with a basic uh, introduction to symmetric encryption we will do it using OpenSSL. So a symmetric encryption means, and that is the very basic meaning, that we take a plain text, we use an algorithm, which is a mathematical function that uses substitution and uses transpositioning, and we are using a key, a key that is known to both parties. The key is the same. Later on, we will deal with the key space and what does it mean. And now we will take the plain text and we will use the algorithm together with the key to turn it into a cipher text. So if we'll open up a text file and let's write down Fortinet secret key and now let's um, save it. Let's save the file as a Fortinet. Let's open it again, just to make sure that we have the plain text. And now let's use OpenSSL. Let's use AES128. AES is a symmetric encryption algorithm. In our case, we are using key space of 128 bits, that is 2 to the power of 128. And let's insert the 40 net text and let's output a cipher text. Let's call it cipher 40 net. We are asked to insert a password. The password is not the key. The password is part of the key derivation. So let's enter the password. Let's enter it again. 